how exactly does this AI mapping system work and what's it telling you now about the coronavirus? Right. So it's great to be here. And truly what's challenging about public health uh, issues like the emerging coronavirus is getting enough detail in real time about what's happening on the ground. There's only so much public health agencies can do and for, public, for health systems to be able to track these cases. Now, if you think about the digital exhaust, right, like our interactions with social media, our search queries online, all of that information is incredibly valuable, but it's, it's, it's a huge, messy set of data. But if we start tapping into that sort of digital exhaust and get insights through machine learning and AI, you can pinpoint early events before they really get sort of bubble up to officials. So with coronavirus, the earliest signs actually came out of local media, social media sites like Weibo and WeChat that were talking about this mysterious outbreak that was only like a dozen people out of the seafood market in Wuhan that ultimately became the major event we're seeing today. But again, what we're able to see is these, these small signals that would be challenging to look at from any sort of government entity. So what's it telling you about the coronavirus then right now? Well, of course, we've been using our tool not just in the earliest points to, to identify the outbreak, but to track it as it spread, right? So if we can start to map out cases as they are identified across the globe, we can quickly feed that information to modelers, make projections, understand case fatality. You know, obviously what we're seeing is a huge amount of cases that are emerging that, you know, maybe have not interacted with health systems. We know that there's a lot of cases that are asymptomatic. What we're trying to do is understand the spread in real time to prepare governments and populations for the ultimate sort of inevitable um, arrival of this new virus. In terms of usefulness, though, uh, Emily pointed out there that when it first broke out, the virus was only rated a three out of five of seriousness. Uh, by then, yeah. by the time it had become clear how serious it was, it, it had spread far and wide. So were there still some limitations yeah. to this as a tool? Absolutely. You know, AI is just one of a, you know, a series of tools that public health has. At the end of the day, it's really about the frontline workers, epidemiologists, public health experts that really need to process that information. In fact, <coughs> we were communicating early on with the WHO about these events. Um, they are the ones that ultimately make decisions about what kind of response to take on. You have to understand there are many clusters of respiratory outbreaks that happen on a daily basis that you know are unidentified. So the challenge of looking at this one event and deciding, oh, this could turn into a global pandemic, it's it's a real challenge. But it does spell the fact that you know these tools are identifying signals, they're getting communicated, and ultimately we've seen an incredible response both in China but uh, on the world stage as well. Yes, yeah, so to your point, uh, b before we started today, I was playing around with Health Map and I discovered that the neighbouring province of Hunan in China has currently got an avian flu outbreak. So uh, how do we weigh the seriousness of that? It's really challenging. And of course, you know, even within the U.S. right now, we're, we're, we're dealing with influenza. We know flu leads to incredible mortality. There's still a big push to get people to vaccinate, right? And so there's a, a major sort of ability for us to, to handle a new virus, plus dealing with our seasonal viruses that have similar, if not even sometimes greater impact. And so, you know, the point of these tools is to sort of provide visibility, transparency, hopefully encourage people to sort of take the right precautions regardless if it's coronavirus, right? The idea of hand washing, proper hygiene, all of these things are sort of baseline public health that, you know, you should be practicing regardless of, of what kind of virus is around the corner. At the same time, this technology holds a lot of promise, Dr. Brownstein. What about the limitations of artificial intelligence yeah. and, 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 and a rapidly evolving disease on the ground. Yeah, right. So, you know, AI can only do so much to uncover signals, understand the relative severity. What we really need is humans in the loop, right? So we're working not just with our machine learning technologies, but with national and international networks of experts, right? They're the ones that are looking at this information, processing, contextualizing it, and ultimately helping make better decisions. Now, we can uncover mass amounts of data through all these various social networks and process it and put it in the hands of experts, but it's ultimately those experts that are helping you're taking that situational awareness and, and sort of making this critical, these critical decisions. So it's not about sort of AI replacing sort of what a public health agency can do, but it's really augmenting them with the best possible data that's out there in real time. Now, when you look at the data, do you see any potential hotspots that we might not be aware of, that people aren't talking about yet, that governments need to know about? 
I mean, ultimately, what we're seeing is bubbling up of cases across, you know, the Middle East and now starting in Europe. It's not too dissimilar from what we're seeing through sort of, you know, traditional sources. What we're really interested in is picking up some of the early insights of what might happen in the U.S., and that's why we're tapping in to sort of new types of data streams, crowdsourced information, search queries, you know, on Google and other, other search engines. The idea that we're now really looking at, at, at fine-grained, detailed data to see, are we going to miss, you know, the clusters of cases that are going to pop up within the U.S.? And that's really the focus right now is, you know, are we going to be able to see the increase of cases that likely will hit the U.S.? at the earliest outset so we can really prepare the population because we ultimately know that you know public health and health systems are going to be incredibly o overwhelmed and also possibly cases will go miss we know that the sort of uh, travel history concept is really not as solid, right, because we've seen cases pop up around the globe, so you can't really think about travel history as a way to, to understand whether we might be seeing cases. So what we're doing is sort of surveying the population through a tool we've developed called Flu Near You and, and others, which are hopefully giving us a, that early insight um, for, when, for when that inevitable sort of event happens within the U.S.